like one of his friends. He, he prides himself in never having a boss his whole adult life. Um, yes, and he, he he's uh, he's got a company called Freeland uh, Ventures. Um, he's also got a coaching program and some other things like that. But or don't you have a yeah you know, strategic real estate coach? Right. That's your that's your podcast. Well, yeah, the podcast right. is called Accelerated Investor. Our coaching and all that stuff is called Strategic Real Estate Coach. And uh, but what I like to talk about is raising money, deploying money, owning assets, and uh, that's what we'll talk about today, brother. So this is me always screwing up. I always screw up the intro. I can never do it right. But listen, you know, it's perfect. And life just fail a lot and it doesn't matter. People will still come on your show. That's great. That's right. So Josh, welcome to the show, brother. Thanks a lot. Corey, good to be here, man. We had we had you on my show a couple weeks ago. That took like eight months to get done. It's miraculous that you and I were able to nail this down like a week or two after the other show. I mean, but we yeah, did it back to back, on, you, so it's it's back to back. It's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so let's let's just jump into private money. Yeah. Because I mean, so many people need to understand this and, you know, kind of just give us your background, how you started, how you got into it and why you're such a big proponent of, of it as well. Sure. Yeah. Well, I think it starts with this philosophy, Corey. Thanks for asking the question is, is funding equals freedom. Funding equals freedom. And, you know, it doesn't have to be your money. It doesn't have to be your funding, but funding from someone else equals freedom. Because although so many people love real estate, a lot of us, fall into the, the the trap of transactional, uh, maybe single family homes or wholesaling or flipping apartments, as opposed to owning the asset long term, which provides true wealth, true, you know, financial security, true freedom and major tax advantages. Um, and so when I was, uh, when I got started in my, my, my career, I started investing full time in 2004, all the way up until 2011, I was very transactional wholesaling, short sales, rehabs, um, you know, and then I, then I got the, the news of a lifetime, brother. I mean, I got diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. I was 35 years old. I had a, a wife and two kids. She was eight months pregnant with my third. And, you know, you're not ready for the news. When, you, you know, I came home just like on a day like today, I'm at my office, we're shaking and baking, we're making money. I come home, Corey, I literally am playing with my girls. They're two and one years old. We're wrestling on the floor, monkeying around. I lay down, I cross my hands across my stomach. And sure enough, I'm looking up at the uh, ceiling fan and I feel this massive lump on the left side of my stomach. And I yelled to my wife, I'm like, hey, honey, come here and check this out. And uh, she's kind of poking around. And I look at her, I'm like, you know, shit, that can't be good, you know? And I tried to kind of try to joke around about it, but I immediately knew something was wrong. And so that experience of, of going through that process of being diagnosed, it really changed my perspective on a lot of things about life, about relationships and about business. And we can talk a little bit more about the surgery, but what happened was, is I realized I had made a massive mistake because now over the next couple months, I had to go through all kinds of doctor's appointments, going down for testing, going down for blood work, meeting with my surgeon, planning out a surgery. And then, you know, I knew it was going to be a several month recovery. And all of a sudden, guess what Josh had? No cash flow. No cash flow. Damn, bro. Right? Rent wasn't due on the first of the month because I didn't have a lot of rents due on the first of the month, right? So didn't have a lot of cash flow. So we bled, man. Wow. We bled for like wow. eight months. And, um, but That's one thing crazy. I did right, which leads me to my passion for private money is about three or four weeks before my, this surgery, um, I bought a couple, I bought a couple investment properties, just, you know, single family homes. I was going to turn into rentals or flips and I went and bought these properties, but I got true private money for those deals. And they put up all the money for the purchase, all the money for the renovations, all the money for the soft costs, zero dollars out of my own pocket. I bought the properties, turned them over to my property manager to manage the deals. And I went in for surgery and I basically disappeared from the face of the earth for about the next three or four months. And during that time, my team renovated the properties, fixed them up. And then about four months later, we cashed checks on both of those deals. And I made $80,000 profit, 40,000 from one and about 36,000 from the other. And I thought, well, shit, that was awesome. Like how, how did, how did that just work? Because I wasn't, right. There, I was literally in the hospital. I was upstairs in my master bedroom recovering from this massive surgery. I wasn't on site 
I wasn't managing a, 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 a wholesale deal or a short sale negotiation. I wasn't on site doing any work. I wasn't rehabbing the kitchen or slinging sheetrock and hammers. How the hell did that just happen? And I thought to myself, well, it started because you had the money to buy the asset. It started right. because you had the funding. That's what created you this little tiny glimpse of freedom and the light bulb went off. And that's really where my passion started from, from that, that amazing experience. Wow. Yeah. It's taking something that was just painful and coming out the backside of it and saying, wait a second, this is, there's, there's some, there's some things here that may work. Yes. Right now. And in in, when you got that private money, uh, like, cause I love how you, 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 you talk about the freedom that it brings, right? Cause it really is freedom. Right. I, I believe wholeheartedly in what you just said, because it's rang true in my life as well. Um, Sure. Then how do you, then how did you keep going forward? Sure. Yeah. So I, I, I thought to myself, well, this is what I want to do now. I don't want to be transactional anymore. The other thing that this whole surgery, Corey, allowed me to do was take a step back. And I think that's what so many people don't do is they get into real estate thinking they want to own a bunch of apartments like you do, or own a bunch of apartments like I do, or they want to run a private equity fund and raise money, but they fall in love with the immediate satisfaction of a transactional deal. And it's like right. crack cocaine, they can't get off of it. It's like, I want more of that transactional stuff because it's bigger money, it's more instant gratification. So this whole experience allowed me, Corey, to step back and force me to, because I literally couldn't go to work. Um, I mean, I had, I had 13 inch incision in my stomach and staples and it took out all my guts and I lost 50 pounds in three weeks. I literally couldn't get to work. So oh you spent gosh. a lot of time thinking, brother, you spent a lot of time thinking when you're alone and you know, you're just about how, about life, right? How am I going to get out of this? I, how, and how do I recover? And what do I, what, what's important now? Right? Yeah. What's important. And I'm, I, and I started thinking to myself, like, what the hell am I doing? I've been in this business now for like seven years. I've done hundreds and hundreds of deals. We've made millions of dollars and I don't really own a whole lot of assets but tomorrow you start from zero right and so like when 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 people say like you know you got to own the asset because you don't want to start over you don't want to be transactional i lived that mistake like i was that mistake that copywriters write about i was the guy so i i, I got the time to step back and think like man you know a lot about real estate but you've done right. it all wrong so let's start over so, so let's it, pivot yeah, let's pivot. And so I came out of that and I thought, well, let's do what we know. We know residential. Let's start with residential. Let's start raising a bunch of money and let's get into a whole bunch of deals. And that's what we did. We did we started doing 20, 30, 50 rehabs a deal, 13, 15 at a time. We built a huge construction crew and then we started making bigger money on big flips. And that, that, that I, I made the mistake of still Although the money was bigger and it was less work for me, um, I was able to control the asset, but I still got it wrong because it was still relatively transactional right. because it was just big rehab flips. And then by 2014, 15, I figured that out and I thought, you know what? I'm gonna get on the debt side of this thing. I I'm actually gonna become, instead of being the operator all the time, I'm gonna create passive cash flow by lending my money and uh, aggregating and pulling other people's money into our private equity fund and lending that out and creating passive income at that time was through notes and mortgages. So started again, you kind of take a couple steps forward, learn a couple things. And then you're like, well, that still doesn't feel quite right. Then you try something else, a couple steps forward, it still doesn't feel quite right. So we've been running this fund now for a couple years and still didn't feel quite right. Really successful, made over 400 private money loans and still didn't feel quite right. So finally, about two, three years ago, our investors, Corey, came to us and said, hey, Josh, this fund is awesome. We're getting great double digit returns. Really appreciate all your hard work. What else do you have? What else do you got? And I, I knew a bunch of my buddies that were in apartments, right? That were into pri you know, private money and apartments, private money and syndication, private money and income properties. And I thought, well, let me go partner with them. Let's, let's figure out how we can get involved in transactions on the general, general partnership side, have a ton of experience and tons of money. And then if I find the right operator, the right deal, 
I partner with the right person, then I know I've got investors that want to invest. And that's finally how I ended up in your world of multifamily. And that was a couple of years ago. Now we own eight massive complexes, uh, 2,400 units, got over uh, 10, $12 million in apartment deals right now, of my money and other people's money. And finally, Corey, I think I got it right. It's taken me this long. See, it is, that is awesome. Cause that's like, like, that's like the whole ladder of like, I, man, you know, to, you know, seven years of the trial of, of pain and ended up doing it, doing it, doing it to then, Hey man, we're, we're changing the model and, but I, you're resourceful. Every time you, you didn't, it didn't feel right. That's called resourcefulness. Yeah. I don't think, and like, I always think about it, like by the time this gets produced, it's going to be like almost first of the year or like beginning of the year. And there's something to say about looking at your business and saying, is it, are we in the right spot? Yeah. Right. Cause you know, when you're really in the right spot, because all these things, cause your dreams and goals were cash flow at time, freedom, your family. Yeah. And I tell you, you were getting something that were, were producing those types of results in the way that you were doing it. Cause you weren't, you're obviously not afraid of work. Right. Right. I mean, uh, you're uh, grinding much. all those pieces, right? Like, I mean, that's what it is. But when you find the right mechanism, you're like, wait a second, this is a lot easier than I thought. Yeah. You know, it's still got its own challenges. I think but it was I'm the getting... transition, Corey. The big part of it was I got to the point where I thought, you know, I've just got to take the long view at some point. And I think I got addicted like to the crack cocaine of a transactional yeah. work and transactional deals and a big income, you know, a million dollar income and this and that. But it, it just never really was ultimately the reason why I got in this thing in the first place, 12, 15 years ago, a passive income owning for the long game, legacy right? wealth, the long game. And so if there's one thing I can impress upon your listeners is to one of the biggest regrets I have um, is out of the 700 residential deals that I did, that I didn't keep them all. Right. Yeah. And I didn't keep them all. And the apartments that I flipped, the apartments that I funded, even if I've been as a private lender, that I didn't just get involved and keep them all, right? So if I could tell all your listeners, like, yeah, sure, you might need to do some transactional work just to pay the bills, but just do enough just to pay the bills and keep every other asset. Keep the play, play keep, keep playing the long game. That's right, the long game. Because the long game provides tax benefits, massive tax benefits, massive appreciation, massive principal pay down over the long haul. And you've got to be patient for that. Think about the mindset too. It's really a different mindset. Don't you think like, I always look at like what my mindset was before and what it is now. And when I go to even networking events and talking with single family networking events versus the multifamily, I'm like, it's a totally different person that's yeah. usually looking at multifamily because their view is, it's not immediate. Yeah. It's not immediate. That's right. So like building a team, building a great company or building a great sports team, like you don't take a crappy team. Like I'm, a, I'm from Cleveland, right? Cleveland's been so bad for so long. I'm not even a Browns fan anymore. I gave up on the Browns 10, 15 years ago. But if you're going to change the Browns for the long haul, it's got to be a process, which means you got to take the long view. You got to change the culture. You got to change the administrative staff. You got to change ownership. You got to change the general manager, all the players on the field. You got to change the stadium. You got to change the look and feel of the uniforms, the long game. That's the only way you do it, right? Yeah. Same thing with the business that we're in now, the multifamily long term cash flow game. You know, you may buy a deal. You and Corey know this just as good as anybody. You may buy a deal and may not have any cash flow from it. For a year or two while you stay for a year it. or two. Yeah. And you, you, but at the end of a year or two or three or whatever that year, is, whatever that time frame is, whether it's a refinance or you hit stability, now all of a sudden there's massive cash flow for the rest of your life. It's an amazing, amazing experience. Most people, like, they look at that, they're like, dude, uh, man, I'm, I mean, like, so, cause I always say, like, when you're going through a, an apartment deal, it does, it's a warm up process. And the, it sometimes is a two year incubator, but I think you hit it right on the head is cause when it does, it doesn't stop. Yeah. Right. Once you get there, then it doesn't stop, man. It doesn't stop. The thing about so many people, what do they do? They work for 30, 35 years, still in today's world. There's so many different ways to make money, but we're so conditioned for the 30 to 35 year work, 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 work to build assets to create income, to live on. 
And even in the middle of all this chaos and all these different changes and stop starts that I've had over the years, I mean, we're an educator. We've, we, we've got tens of thousands of students and it's huge following and I've screwed it all up sometimes. But when I look at it, just a couple of the deals, just take one for, for example, when that one deal is stabilized, which is gonna happen in July, this coming year, it's projected to refinance. We'll make over $100,000 of net free cash flow from that one deal. And that's only gonna get bigger, right? And that's kind of a mediocre deal for us small. We get, it's kind of cut up a thousand right. different ways with different partners and things. So we're, I'll personally make about a hundred thousand bucks a year. But what does that mean relative to what normal people do with their condition, get a job, save and slave, right? So I would have to build up, let's say $2 million income. I'd have to make $2 million, spend 50% of it on taxes, Whoa. take the million, then invest it and get about an eight to 10% return to accomplish what we did with one real estate deal inside of a year. It's a I mean, not even <laughs> close. You can't possibly compare the two. It's nuts. So to know your game and to learn from you, Corey, and to see the things that you provide to your students and your podcasts and your trainings and your events, it's like, you, I can't, because I've been through the 14 year trial to try to get to where I wish I was 14 years ago. Um, I would just encourage all your people to really dig in now. Don't be afraid of a hundred unit deal. Don't be afraid of a 50 unit deal or a 400 unit deal. It just, just takes the right partners. Um, and, and, the, and the money and the right team to put it together and get in on that stuff now. Don't don't go the route that I went, that's for sure. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm the same way. Like, dude, I wish, my only regret is I didn't start multifamily way sooner. Mm -hmm. Like, gosh, if I could have been buying multifamily in 09, 010, I didn't right. buy it till 11, which was good, but I really wish I would have bought a lot more properties back when it was just crazy. Oh, so, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, so what, what are some like tactics that you would say that you do in an employee in raising money? What are some things you give us some nuggets yeah, to I, help, help listeners go? That, great question, Corey. So I've actually got a 12 step process. Obviously we don't have time to cover all that right now, but I'll cover the first couple because I think this is really where it starts. First of all, like most things it's gonna start up here with the five inches or six inches between your ears. I had a friend of mine that totally changed my perspective on real estate and raising money. A friend of mine, his name is Francis. You might know Corey Francis Abola. I've known for 10, 12 years. He's a copywriter. He's amazing at selling and marketing. But he said to me years ago, he said, Josh, look, if, if you have a business, it doesn't matter if you sell widgets, you sell cars, you real estate, private money, whatever it is. If you truly feel like what you have to sell will increase this, the other person buying your service or using your service, if you feel like their life is going to be significantly better off by using your service and you feel like they're going to be worse off if they don't, then you have a moral obligation to sell it to them. Okay. Amen. So when I heard that, I thought, you know, because I used to be a financial advisor. So I know what the stock market produces. I know the slave and save mentality. My, you know, my father broke that curse when he went and became an entrepreneur. So when I, when I thought about real estate and raising private money in that way, I thought I've got a moral obligation to help people understand they could do so much better with their money by yeah. being involved in real estate, whether it's an active investor or a passive investor. So it started there. Then, I went into the tactics and I started saying, okay, what do I need to do to just get started with knowing people? So I started doing this about seven years ago, shortly after my surgery, I became actually very tactical, strategic about raising money. So the first thing I did was I thought of where are all the places I can go to meet people who could be potential private lenders or partners. So I started thinking, obviously real estate investor clubs, meetups, home builders associations, I mean, if yacht club, if you, if you like boating, golf clubs, uh, social organizations, BNI groups, and now you add things like real estate groups on Facebook or podcasting or speaking at events, maybe LinkedIn, where are the places you can go to just be a megaphone for your business and for yourself? Okay. So make that list. 
and then strategically attend those functions. Again, you might go to some functions and say, oh, that really wasn't worth my time. And you go to another function and you have an opportunity and you talk to people like, wow, there's some really high level people there. So how I've actually used this in my own business, Corey, is I like to recruit capital from guys that own e-commerce businesses. Yep. They have a lot of free cash flow. They have businesses that have potentially hockey stick growth. And they want to, they love their tech businesses or their e-com businesses, but they want to park their, their profits in real estate. So I go to as many e-com events and seminars as I possibly can. I yep. like to get to know e-com guys because they love real estate and the tax advantages, but they don't want to be active operators. So <laughs> right. I've made that list. That's step number one. Step number two, who are the people that you already know that can either one, sell you a property. Two, you can buy a property from you. Three, that you can actually refer you deals, that can refer you investors, refer you properties, people that can become a cheerleader for you. So I made a list. When I was a financial advisor, Corey, I created on day one of being a financial advisor, they said, Josh, create your Project 100. And I said, well, what the hell is a Project 100? They said, make a list of 100 of your friends and family. Yeah. And that was all the way back when I was 22 years old. Now in real estate, I've done essentially the same thing, but I didn't go in thinking that they were all going to be investors. What I thought of is who can I educate about what I do? Who could just be another megaphone for me? Who can, Correct. who can tell their friends and just say, Let hey, me people, find the influencers. The influ exactly. Who can help me expand my reach? Not necessarily invest or become a direct investor, but expand my reach. And so who can be a megaphone for me? And then of course, those people, once you teach them what you do, those people also could become an investor. So what I've done is I've gone to my, my friends, my family, and I said, look, this is what I'm doing in real estate. I walk them through back before it was a rental residential deal. Now it's a multifamily deal. And I say, this is how we structure deals. This is how we bring in investors. This is what a general partner is. This is the returns that we've paid on previous deals. You know, we give them a preferred return, maybe plus a percentage of ownership or a preferred return and part of the cash out refi proceeds. Here's how we pay people in the past. Now, instead of saying, do you want to invest? What I would say is like, I, I didn't meet you today because I assumed that you had any interest in this at all, but we've been friends for a long time. So all I'm asking is if you know anybody that it might be interested in real estate or learning more about what I do, right? Just introduce them to me, pass along my business card, have them give me a buzz on my cell phone. And what they would always say, Corey, is this. And this is the magic words I want to hear. What about me? Right? <laughs> this is awesome. What about me? So, and there's a funny story around this, Corey, you'll appreciate. So this is going to go back. I hope my wife does. Our stories are so close. It's not yeah. even funny. I, hope my, I, don't, I don't care if my wife hears this. So I met a girl. I was in St. Thomas in the Virgin Islands. This is all the back when I was 26 years old. This story is not going to get dirty. Although you might like it to get dirty, Corey. This, I'm not going to go dirty on your podcast. So <laughs> anyway, um, meet this girl. We, we hit it off. She's there for 10 days. I'm there for about two weeks. We end up spending a lot of time there together. Really hit it off. Well, the last night before I'm about to fly out, we're out at dinner and we're hanging out. And we're talking about like the perfect in her world, like who's the perfect man. And I'm talking about who's the perfect girl. And I thought, you know, if I had a girlfriend, she would be like this, this, this started describing the characteristics. And you know what she said? What about me? She said that. So, so not that she wanted to be my girlfriend, but she was almost, I think she felt mad because I was describing this person and she almost felt like a little bit like disrespected that I was talking about this in such detail. And here we are hanging out together, but Fast forward in my real estate business, I thought, you know, if I could describe what I do and, and, and it sounds, real estate sounds sexy, it sounds amazing, which it is, there's all these benefits and not hard pitch people, but just educate people. And then I, I don't ask them to invest and they say, well, Josh was totally cool, totally respectable. He didn't ask me, right? Didn't ask me for money. And now he's going to go to my friends and he, I'm going to give them the deal of a lifetime. No freaking way. What about me? So that's the magic words, right? So if I actually is the magic words, bro. it's spread Corey, like wildfire. Now we have 250 investors. We managed $35 million of private money truly off of those three concepts, right? 
Where can I go to meet people? Where within my 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 sphere, my spider web, who can I just go educate without being cool or, or without being weird, just you know, being totally cool? And then saying, well, if you know anyone who's interested in doing something like this, whether it's actively, passively, or just referring or cheerleading for me, just pass them along to me and then hoping for those magic words, what about me? And that's worked over and over and over again. God, but, I don't know you, you don't know if you know this. This is I teach this. Like that's you're, you're you just really? saying I didn't know that. I'm, no, that's my absolute story. Like that's how I raised my first piece of money, and I did it by accident. I was asking a guy for help. Okay. I was like, here's my deal. Here I'm selling the whole sizzle. And I wasn't even pitching him. I was like, I just want to know the people that you know. I want you to feel good about referring yeah. me somebody. And then he said, What about me? What about me? Yeah. It's and awesome, right? That was my first piece. And that is, gosh, dang. We not we didn't even set this up, but I'm like, that is, that is yeah. dude. Boom. Dude, high five. Hands down. Yes. That is awesome. So, so the last thing, the other tactic um that I, I think will be very helpful for your listeners to hear something that I do. When when I'm at a game or uh, you know, when I'm at a sports game, a Browns game, a Cavs game, I just meet somebody at a bar, a restaurant, I'm at one of my kids' sports functions, whatever. I find it fascinating that women can meet other women and they can do like a deep conversation right away about amazing things about their kids, and they just can get they can connect so fast. Women can. Now, us dudes, totally different, right? So for us dudes, it's like weather sports and then like what do you do like right we're, we're like total right. cavemen up here the, the guys are right so I, i've realized that that's typically where the conversation is going to go because it's natural and guys aren't real deep we're like we're more surfacey with each other at, at least at the beginning and and so i know that's how the conversation is going to go now i've been very tactical in listening how men and women communicate and I know now if I'm at a place, I know that's where the conversation is going to go. Weather, sports, and then what do you do? So I will start that conversation and just say, hey, so instead of saying, what do you do? I'll say, hey, man, so what are you into? Like, what do you like to do? Not like, what do they do for work? But what do you like to do? Because yeah, I know fun. I've had these conversations over and over. Now, most men are cavemen. They're going to come back and they're going to ask me in return, well, Josh, what do you do? And they're thinking more about work, right? Because they're not as strategic about this as I am. So now when they ask me, what do you do? I don't say I'm a multifamily investor. I don't say I run a fund. I don't say I, I flip single family homes. I don't say any of that. What I say is I raise capital for real estate investments. We buy distressed assets and apartment buildings, and we pay our investors a fixed double digit rate of return right? That little elevator pitch. Yep. It doesn't have to be much, just a little time again, because I want them thinking about me as the top of mind. And it off, often what they'll say is, is things like, you know, the older guys will say, uh, yeah, like I, I, I read Robert Kiyosaki's book, or, you know, I bought a Carlton Sheets info, info course, or I've always wanted to buy a rental property. But what people will often say is, how does that work? Yes. How does it work? My response is it works. I don't tell them. My response is it works great. Like that's all I say. It works great. It's the takeaway. Right. It's like, the Heisman. You're doing the Heisman right there, dude. That's right. So give them the bait, then take the take take the bait away. Then if they push, which they often will do, now they'll start to nudge. Like, how does it really work? Because I'm kind of laughing. Oh, it works great. They're like, how does it really work? And then I, now, again, the tactic is I use the SEC to my advantage. And I actually say to them, listen, um, you know, we raise a lot of money. I have a lot of investors, uh, you know, I'll, I'll drop a little hint. I have 250 investors, we raised $35 million of private capital, but the SEC has specific requirements that I really can't talk about my deals or offers or specifics unless I have a prior existing relationship with the investor. So let, let, let's do this. Let me give you my cell phone number. So I say, you know, here's my number. Why don't we hook up for a beer or, like, you know, a bowl of loudmouth soup or, you know, coffee or whatever? Yeah. Um, why don't we Why don't we meet up next week? So now I take the pressure off because I don't want to get into a, 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 a thick conversation standing on the sidelines of my daughter's, no. you know, basketball game. I don't want to do that. Neither does it's he. It's not the place. You can't even not do it correctly, place. right? 
Right. So, but now I've got the bait. Now, <clears throat> most people don't carry business cards anymore. What do they carry? Cell phone, right? Yeah. So again, giving starts the receiving process. Giving starts the receiving process. So I'm like, hey man, let's say his name is Johnny. Hey John, great to meet you. Like, would love, love to connect with you. Obviously we're at this game. Don't have a lot of time to go into detail, but here's my cell phone number. Here's my cell phone. Da, 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 da. Why don't you call me back right now or text me back right now so I have yours. And what do we do? We just exchange virtual business cards, right? Amen to that. And now I can go into my next, and then I can text them back a couple days later. Now it's like back to dating, right? Do you right, text the guy saying, that you're, night? You're moving to set the appointment. At you got to set the appointment, but again, you got to wait. Can't look desperate. It's just like dating a girl. You got to wait three, uh, four yeah. days. So you text him back. Hey, it was great you're to playing see the game. game. Yeah. So he's waiting for the call. And when you don't call, the, the, the slower you go, again, another tactic, the slower you go, the more money people will invest and the more often. The faster you go, the less money they'll invest and the less often. So you got to build relationships and build deal flow uh, at the same time. Two tra trains going down two tracks at the same time. Deal flow on one train, money in the other. But you got to have the money kind of teed up before the deal comes, right? You just raised $5 million for your re most recent deal. Amazing. I bet you had most of those relationships built up over time or they yep. invested in a previous deal and then also when you brought them a deal they were like yep yeah, i'm in right yep, so every build, time. Up, build up that war chest of investors then bring them and say hey if i bring you a deal that looks like this would you be interested in a future deal and they say yeah if it looks like that I, I, i'd be interested in looking at it great okay i'll put you on the in the warm bucket that you're warm you're, you're mildly interested if you found a deal like this, if I found a deal, how much money do you think you'd be comfortable with starting with? Yes, there you go. Now, Corey, what are they going to start with? They're always going to go minimum. bottom feeding. They're going to go bottom feeding for what's the minimum. Yep. Okay. So set your minimum high. What I do is I tell people, look, my minimum is 250000 bucks, or my minimum is $100,000. Set a big number because you can always make the exception, right? If you yeah. say, my minimum is 200,000, the guy's like, well, I've only got 125. Well, let me see if I can fit you in. Let me see if, you know, 125, we put the puzzle pieces together. You come back in a couple of days. All right, find a spot for you. I got to make an exception, but 125 will work. Instead of if you say my minimum's 25, guess what they'll do? They'll give you 25 grand to start you off. So, and again, I, how do I know that? Because I started a fund years ago, and guess what I started my minimum with? 10 grand. Yeah. Okay. Like an idiot. This is what my yeah. SEC attorney told me. Start it with 10 grand so you can get a lot of people in. That was the dumbest thing ever. You should have started at 100 minimum, which is what we ended up bumping it up to, and that worked. So those are so some I do 100, tactics, but my, you're challenging me right now. So, like, I'm going to step up my game because, like, my minimum is 100, and it used to be 50. Then I raised it to 100. I was like, oh, now I get 100,000. Like, I should say two and a quarter. Yeah. Like, gosh dang. I'm just, I'm just going to make that my new rule. Just because yeah. I, because I know the it's just the law of what'll happen is that I'll start finding two hundred thousand dollar chunks instead of a hundred, and you mm -hmm. can always make the exception. Or right. how close to two hundred can you come? Right. Wouldn't it be awesome if all you had was guys that had a million dollars? So the only way we can get there is by constantly leveling up. So and if you got guys that have two hundred thousand liquid to invest, they've probably got a half a million to a million of real money, or maybe more to invest and they can start with 200 and the other beauty of it Corey, right is then they got all their friends they start thinking of who do they know who's got at least 200 who's going to be accredited worth a couple million bucks and now instead of dealing with people who might be worth 500,000 or 800,000 now you're consistently dealing with people who are worth a million two million five million ten million and more and all it is for us right is it's just mindset Corey. it's just like it's mindset again i, I i've had to level up over time just like my residential game just like raising money. I started with 10 grand because I thought, wow, that's a lot of money to ask people. Now it's like, if people want to invest any less than a hundred, I'm like, eh, it's kind of annoying. It's not enough. Yeah, it really is. It's like, it's frustrating, right? Right, right. So there's some tactics, and, and man. I hope that was no. helpful. Dude, that is amazing. That's actually, you, you know, it's so funny. And Josh, I mean, I teach exactly what you just said, right? Because that, that is, and, and I did it the, you know, we've not even talked about this yeah. part at all. I've never seen you but, teach it. You've never seen me teach it. 
No. I've never been to one of your events or gone through your No, but I say it, the, I mean, I swear to God that my first rule is never ask people for money. Only ask who they know. Right. Right? Like, hey, listen, I just, because you teach them and teach everything that you do, sell the sizzle, they always say what your favorite three words yeah. are. What about right? me? Yeah. Dude, that is, I mean, but really, so that's, it's, so this should be comforting. Anybody that's listening to this video right now, or this podcast, is because fundamentally, like, I think you're a very good money raiser. I know you are. And um, I feel like I'm pretty good too. Yeah. And here's two people saying pretty much the same thing and it works. Mm -hmm. So take that action like, and make that work. Now, listen, if people want to get a hold of you and get into, uh, you know, you have education and things like that, and I'm yeah. really the details of how you do this. How well, do they get a hold of you? The easiest thing, Corey, is we've got, a, we've got our book. Uh, this book just journalizes my experience with cancer. Um, all a lot of the mistakes that I've made. It's a lot of the things we talked about today. Uh, it's free. Just pay the shipping and handling. They can get it at, uh, it's called it's called the Flip System. Um, so getflipsystem.com. Um, they can get the book for free. Just pay the shipping. Um, and again, it's probably half of it's about my story about cancer and a lot of the personal things that I overcome. Uh, another quarter up to 30% of it's all about raising money, which you know people will really enjoy. And then the rest of it's more tactical about doing deals. So, uh, but that's, that's a good place to start for sure. Uh, and then our podcast is Accelerated Investor. So if they, you know, they want to listen to that podcast as well, and your episode uh, on our channel is, is is fantastic. They can look that up in iTunes. Yeah, no, this is awesome, dude. That, that's, I mean, listen, uh, I already know, like, this is a place where you should go. You should go check out his podcast for real. Um, and and honestly, if you don't get that book, I, I, I'm going to get that book. I want to hear that story and read it uh, and just feel, feel that journey. Um, the journey is rewarding. Uh, listen, thanks again for your time, brother. It awesome. really has been awesome. Guys, uh, you know, out there, it, one, one of the things Josh really said is it's all about mindset. He started off opening this podcast is the first thing he did was he got his mind right. The little six inches between your ears is so important because if you believe it, you can achieve it. That's right. And your paradise is possible.